Thank you for coming out this afternoon. Uh, it's the hardest lecture time as usual after lunch, and it's nice outside, and so uh, I should do an entertaining lecture. But this is all oh, Mary is not in her head big time. Uh, but I'm a German, and some things are deeply ingrained. And, and one is that, that we, we only we learn over our habituation in the academic world for 10, 12 years how to do proper academic lectures. And to unlearn that is very hard. And so uh, be, part, be patient with me and, and part of my, my part success or part failure in doing something in between. Um, the title of today's um, lecture is The Development of Doctrine what it is and why it matters. To be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. This famous line, blessed John Henry Newman, stated in the opening pages of his seminal essay on the development of doctrine. To be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. But nota bene, the history Newman refers to in his famous statement is not the history presented by the History Channel on TV, <laughs> nor is it the total sum of historical facts some might learn by heart in order to shine a trivial pursuit, nor is it the nor is it the suggested history craftily insinuated to the reader's unguarded imagination in the wave of recent anti-Catholic novels, from Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code to Tom Toybin's The Testament of Mary. Nor is it even the substantive history taught before its recent replacement by social studies at American colleges in the good old days when they still maintained an authentic liberal arts curriculum. Rather, the history Newman refers to with his evocative expression, to be deep in history, is the spirit-guided and spirit-filled history of salvation that the living church holds in her memory. It is the church's memory of the living Christ, the bridegroom, who guides his bride, the church, by way of the comforter he promised to send. The church's memory is deeply informed by Christ's words as communicated by Saint John. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. John 16:13. It is for this reason that a Catholic is deep in history. It is the history of the unfolding truth into which the Spirit guides. And it is for the self-same reason, then, that a Catholic is deep in the Christ-centered and Spirit-filled present. For a Protestant to be deep in history and to be deep in the present are mutually exclusive. Yet for a Catholic, these are two sides of one single reality, the reality of the living, Christ-rooted, and spirit-filled church. This single reality of the ever-unfolding truth of revelation, the Christ-rooted and spirit-filled church, has several essential expressions. A sacramental expression, first and foremost in the sacrifice of the Mass, in Holy Communion, and in the priestly vocation. An institutional expression, the Episcopal hierarchy and apostolic succession, in union with the See of Peter. A charismatic expression, the monastic orders, the ecclesial movements, and the daily spirit-guided witness of all the faithful. A prophetic expression, the theologians, and a doctrinal expression, revelation by way of the holy scriptures and holy tradition, being continuously made explicit and thus being ever alive 
in the ongoing development of doctrine and related to this doctrinal expression, finally, the magisterial expression, the College of Bishops in union with the Pope. All of these expressions of the unfolding truth, sacramental, institutional, charismatic, prophetic, doctrinal, and magisterial, are integral parts of the extension of the incarnate Lord, Christ's body, the living church. To all of these integral expressions of the unfolding truth, strong opposition arose at one or another time in the life of the church. This has also been the case with the church's doctrinal expression, the development of doctrine. There are two characteristic oppositions to the idea of an authentic development of doctrine. On the one hand, there is what I will call the antiquarian. The antiquarian is a purist of origins. Antiquarians are eager to locate the true gospel of Christ behind the various portraits advanced by the four evangelists. Or, in St. Paul's original message, without the later accretions of his disciples, or in the Church of the New Testament canon and the earliest pre-Nicene Church Fathers, without all the later doctrinal additions and complications. For the antiquarian, all developments beyond some allegedly pure origin <clears throat> are nothing but a fall from original truth, an amassment of lighter or graver corruptions that more and more pollute the clear spring water of the pristine source. Return to and union with the origin is the ultimate goal of the antiquarian. On the other hand, there is what I will call the presentist. I made up that word, please excuse me. It's not, you won't find it in the dictionary. And, and you, you spell check it and underline it red if you, if you try to write it. The presentist. For the presentist, all that counts are the convictions we hold right now in the present as we move into the future. The presentist holds the church to be the self-authenticating body of the spirit of the present. Instead of being formed by the spirit-guided history called tradition, the church is the ongoing creative source of tradition. For the presentist, only the current convictions of the faithful matter and have a genuine claim on the church as a whole. The church develops in light of its own norming power its self-authentication. Rupture is an inbuilt moment of this dynamic of the presentist. Rupture is the spirit-granted liberation from the past that once was the creative present of the church of the past. Ecclesial self-authentication in the present is the goal of the presentist to shake off the shackles of past ecclesial self-authentications and to bring about now the self-authentication of the church, of the present. An authentic ecclesial existence, faithful to Catholic teaching, <coughs> excludes antiquarianism and presentism as reductive extremes and simultaneously integrates into a higher synthesis what is true in each one of them. Because without its roots in the original deposit of faith, without a constant return to revelation received in the sacred scriptures and in sacred tradition, the church would cease to be apostolic in its doctrinal substance. She would betray the teaching of the gospel. Yet without living constantly in the Christ-centered and spirit-filled present, the church would turn into a museum, a vast display of precious architectural, liturgical, and intellectual antiques. 
a display of cold memories instead of the throbbing, Christ-rooted and spirit-filled living tradition of the church. And Aquarianism and presentism are constant dangers in the modern church. Dangers that are counteracted best by a robust understanding of the development of doctrine. Such a robust understanding matters greatly because it helps us avoid two dangers, becoming stuck in the past for the past's sake and getting rid of the past for the sake of an ever-changing present. A robust understanding of the development of doctrine will help us realize what it means that, quote, when the spirit of truth comes, it will guide you into all the truth, unquote. If the Spirit sent by Christ indeed guides the Church into all the truth, and if the mission of the Spirit indeed is one single divine act encompassing all created time, then this is true. In the Christ-rooted and Spirit-filled Church to be deep in history and to be deep in the present are two aspects of the self-same reality. The present is the fruit of history, and history is the root of the present. What connects one with the other is the development of doctrine. I shall unpack these initial claims about the development of doctrine in three steps. First, I shall attend to the voice of the reason magisterium to ascertain its teaching on the development of doctrine. In a second step, I shall attend to John Henry Newman's notes of an authentic development of doctrine and apply them to a particular case, the arguably most controversial document of the Second Vatican Council, the Declaration on Religious Freedom, Dignitaris Humani. In the decades since, the Council theologians from both ends of the spectrum have argued that this declaration represents a severe rupture with the Church's traditional teaching, I shall show, with the help of Newman's notes, that the Declaration on Religious Freedom does not consti constitute a rupture and therefore a corruption of doctrine, but rather represents an authentic development of doctrine. And third, and in a third and final step, I shall offer some concluding reflections why the development of doctrine matters, reflections that come back to the dangers of antiquarianism and presentism. Two attitudes that presuppose rupture. Two attitudes that can only be overcome by a sound understanding of the development of doctrine. Let us now turn to our first part and ascertain what the modern magisterium teaches. We find the first important statement of the modern magisterium in the first Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on the Catholic faith, Dei Filius. You realize as a European, the modern church extends for me a little bit further. You might have expected the modern church being post-Vatican II. I have to disappoint you. In the proper sense, the modern church actually, I think, begins with the Council of Trent. But I didn't want to overstretch things and bring you back that far. After all, I'm in America. So, First Vatican Council, Dei Filius. Um, I think you have the quote on, the, on your handout. The doctrine of the faith which God has revealed is put forward not as some philosophical discovery capable of being perfected by human intelligence, but as a divine deposit committed to the spouse of Christ to be faithfully protected and infallibly promulgated. <coughs> Hence, too, that meaning of the sacred dogmas is ever to be maintained which has once been declared by Holy Mother Church, and there must never be any abandonment of this sense under the pretext or in the name of a more profound understanding. May understanding, knowledge, and wisdom increase as ages and centuries roll along and greatly and vigorously flourish in each and all, in the individual and in the whole church, but this only in its proper kind, that is to say, in the same doctrine, the same sense, and the same understanding." Unquote. The fathers of the First Vatican Council emphasize the ongoing identity of meaning 
between a defined teaching and the original deposit of faith. What has been implicit in the deposit may become increasingly explicit and thus afford an ever deeper understanding. But what must be secured is the continuous identity of meaning in this process of ongoing unfolding. In the close to 100 years between the first and the second Vatican Council, falls an extremely rich harvest of Catholic theological reflection on the development of doctrine. John Henry Newman, Maurice Blondel, Francisco Marin Sola, Ambrose Gardet, Léonce de Grandmaison, Henri de Lubac, Yves Congar, Karl Rahner, and other theologians composed significant works on the development of doctrine. In a small but significant volume with the English title, What is Dogma? The eminent Swiss theologian and Cardinal Charles Chonet offers a condensed summary of the best of these efforts, a summary that finds a clear echo in the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitutional divine revelation, Dei Verbum. Cardinal Chonet published the original French version of his small book in 1963, the Verbum was promulgated in 1965. Cardinal Chonet aptly states, quote, On the one hand, that which was contained, contained in the original deposit explicitly is ever kept in mind by the living authority of the Church, while on the other hand, that which was contained in the original deposit implicitly, still in a preconceptual, unformulated way, obscure, yet forceful and unavoidable, is explained and put forward in a conceptual and formulated way by the living authority of the church." Unquote. The development of doctrine lies in the dynamic of unfolding what is implicit in the original deposit of faith into explicit affirmations. The instrument that moves the understanding of the deposit of faith from implicit to explicit is the authority of the Christ-rooted and spirit-filled church. Only two years after the publication of Chenet's book, the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Dei Verbum, states the following in section 8. <clears throat> this tradition, which comes from the apostles, progresses in the church under the assistance of the Holy Spirit. There is growth in understanding of what is handed on, both in words and the realities they signify. This comes about through contemplation and study by believers who ponder these things in their hearts. A reference to the Holy Mother, Luke 2.19. Through the intimate understanding of spiritual things which they experience, and through the preaching of those who, on succeeding to the office of bishop, receive the sure charism of truth. Thus, as the centuries advance, the Church constantly holds its course towards the fullness of God's truth until the day when the words of God reach their fulfillment in the church." Unquote. While the fathers of the First Vatican Council emphasized the ongoing identity of the meaning of dogma with the original deposit, the fathers of the Second Vatican Council emphasized the ongoing dynamic explication of doctrine <coughs> toward the plenitude of divine truth. Far from being contradictory, the two emphases complement each other. To conclude, the development of doctrine is not simply a historical fact that historians of dogma may study, but rather first and foremost an integral component of the church's life, a component that the church has come to hold and teach explicitly. But how do we distinguish between authentic developments of doctrine and developments that are actually corruptions of doctrine. Not every development is necessarily an authentic development. The most stimulating and fruitful resource for gaining clarity on this matter is still the great classic, 
that initiated the modern theological reflection on the development of doctrine. John Henry Newman's famous essay on the development of doctrine. Newman originally published this work in 1845, while he was in the throes of reception into the Catholic Church. In 1878, after Newman had been made a cardinal by Pope Leo XIII, he published a second Catholic and considerably better organized version. This is the version usually reprinted in current editions of Newman's works. In a very instructive book on Newman's thought, the late Cardinal Avery Dulles calls Newman's essay on the development of Christian doctrine one of the most seminal works of 19th century theology. This is a reading invitation, in other words. <laughs> he observes that Newman gave no quarter to dogmatic relativism. He argued vigorously for the irreversibility of dogmas, not necessarily in their wording, but in their meaning. His balanced position represents a middle course between a fluid historicism and a rigid dogmatism. And then Cardinal Dulles continues to observe, quote, from the very outset, Newman opposes the transformist view that Christianity is ever in flux and accommodates itself to the times. For him it is axiomatic that the faith of the apostles must perdure. But in order to retain its vitality and ward off new errors, the living church will sometimes have to articulate its faith in new ways. Granted that development must occur, it must still be asked whether the new formulations are in accord with the ancient faith. To respond to this difficult question, he proposed seven notes or tests for authentic development. Unquote. These seven notes or tests for authentic development of doctrine are, they are listed on your handout, preservation of type, continuity of principles, power of assimilation, logical sequence, anticipation of the future, conservative action on its own past, and finally, chronic vigor. Let's have a brief look at each one of these notes in order to understand them better. The first note is preservation of time. What does Newman mean? He illustrates this note with the help of an analogy from biological life. Quote, preservation of time is readily suggested by the analogy of physical growth, which is such that the parts and proportions of the developed form, however altered, correspond to those which belong to its rudiments. The adult animal has the same make as it had on its birth. Young birds do not grow into fishes, nor does the child degenerate into the brood, wild or domestic, of which he is by inheritance lord. Vincentius of Lorraine adopts this illustration in distinct reference to Christian doctrine. Let the soul's religion, he says, imitate the law of the body, which as years go on develops indeed and opens out its due proportions and yet remains identical with what it was. Small are baby's limbs, our youths are larger, yet they are the same." Unquote. To give an example, not from doctrine, but as Newman likes also to see from certain practices of the church, monasticism. Monasticism emerged as the first charismatic and ascetic movement in the early church, East and West, and has grown into many diverse branches and still exists and flourishes in the Catholic Church, but is not found among Methodists, Presbyterians, or Baptist ecclesial communities. The Catholic Church passes the test of preservation of type in this regard, while the Protestant ecclesial communions do not. 
The second note is continuity of principles. This note is intimately connected to the first one. For in order to preserve its type, the church must be faithful to its foundational principles. They are all on your handout also. Newman advances nine such principles and then adds a tenth, the principle of development. These principles are quite interesting. He lists them as the principle of dogma, the principle of faith, the principle of theology, the sacramental principle, the principle of spiritual, the spiritual sense of scripture, the principle of grace, the principle of asceticism, the principle of the malignity of sin, the principle that matter and the mind are capable of sanctification, and the principle of the development of doctrine. Abandon any one of these principles, and Christianity will be mutilated in one or the other respect. Standing by all of these principles and assuring their continuity is tantamount with the life and vigor of the church. The third note is power of assimilation. Development is a process of incorporation. Development is a process of incorporation. Cardinal Dulles renders this note in an evocative image. As a healthy organism builds itself up by ingesting food, so the church takes in what it assimilates and what is assimilable in the cultures it meets and transforms what it, what it appropriates. And then, to give one example from the classical period, the church and its faith have matured by interaction with the great civilizations of Greece and Rome. But of course it doesn't stop there. The fourth note is logical sequence. Here Newman has in mind the fact that in retrospect, the process of development is capable of logical expression. To quote him directly, a doctrine professed in its mature years by a philosophy of religion is likely to be a true development, not a corruption, in proportion as it seems to be the logical issue of its original teaching." Unquote. There is undoubtedly a logical sequence broadly conceived between the dogma of Mary as Theotokos, Mary as God-bearer, the mother of God, promulgated at the Council of Ephesus, and the dogmas of the Immaculate Conception of the Mother of God and of her Assumption, Body and Soul, into Heaven. The fifth note is anticipation of its future. An ultimate development may be authentic when there is a definitive anticipation at an early period in the history of the idea to which it belongs, Newman states. To mind might come the veneration of the relics of the martyrs as an anticipation of and prelude to the invocation of the saints. The sixth note is conservative action on its own past. <coughs> conservative action on its own past. Newman describes this note thus, quote, a true development may be described as one which is conservative of the course of antecedent developments being really those antecedents and something besides them. It is an addition which illustrates, not obscures, corroborates, not corrects, the body of thought from which it proceeds. And this is its characteristic as contrasted with a corruption." Unquote. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity, rightly understood, does not undermine, but rather affirms the prior and more fundamental doctrine of monotheism. Equally, the Marian dogmas of the Immaculate Conception of the Assumption do not undermine the absolute and surpassing centrality of the incarnate Logos and his exclusive and universal role as Savior, but rather affirm it. The seventh note is chronic vigor. 
by retaining its youthful vigor in spite of its antiquity, the church with its development of doctrine may be presumed to be authentic. By contrast, a corruption, if vigorous, is of brief duration, Newman claims, runs itself out quickly and ends in death. Or, on the other hand, if it lasts, it fails in vigor and passes into decay. Ongoing reform, ongoing charismatic renewal, and ongoing development of doctrine are signs of the church's chronic vigor. The seven notes of authentic development understand development as the sign and characteristic of ongoing but deepening and more explicit identity. Against the danger of antiquarianism, Newman maintains, quote, it is indeed sometimes said that the stream is clearest near the spring. Whatever use may fairly be made of this image, it does not apply to the history of a philosophy of belief, which on the contrary is more equable and purer and stronger when its bed has been become deep and broad and full. In a higher world it is otherwise, but here below, to live is to change, and to be perfect is to have changed often." Unquote. Authentic change is a function of the ongoing identity of meaning, of faithfulness to the principles given in the one single and self-same deposit of faith. Nota bene, Newman saw his notes as applicable to the actual decisions of authority, that is, to a promulgated teaching. They are not at all meant to help project, predict, or even somehow encourage and bring about future developments. Consequently, against the danger of presentism, Newman insists that the development of doctrine is not the tool of ongoing change, managed by self-appointed developers of doctrine, in view of a desired future church whose teaching is to be designed in advance by the self-authenticating church of the ongoing present. Such a grave misunderstanding of the development of doctrine could, according to Newman, only lead to doctrinal corruptions, but not to authentic developments of doctrine. We have now reached the point to turn to the announced test case for an authentic development of doctrine. Second Vatican Council Declaration on Religious Freedom, Dignitatis Humani. So bear with me. Now we're looking at a concrete test case that should be close to the heart of you as Americans especially. Um, and, uh, and there you will see how, how Newman's notes uh, take traction. The famous American Catholic theologian, John Courtney Murray, theological architect of Dignitatis Humanae, as a matter of fact, observes rather dryly that, quote, it was, of course, the most controversial document of the whole council, largely because it raised with sharp emphasis the issue that lay continually below the surface of all the conciliar debates, the issue of the development of doctrine, unquote. We find a telling echo of John Courtney Murray's judgment in the first article of Dignitatis Humanae, quote, In treating of this religious freedom, the Synod intends to develop the teaching of more recent popes on the inviolable rights of the human person and on the regulating of society by law, unquote. Consider the teaching that stands at the very heart and center of Dignitatis Humanae. We find it in Article 2 of the Declaration. Because of its significance, it deserves to be cited in full. Quote, this Vatican Council declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. This freedom means that all human beings are to be immune from coercion, on the part of individuals or of social groups and of any human power in such wise that no one is to be forced to act in a manner contrary to his own beliefs, whether privately 
or publicly, whether alone or in association with others, within due limits. The Council further declares that the right to religious freedom has its foundation in the very dignity of the human person, as this dignity is known through the revealed word of God and by reason itself. This right of the human person to religious freedom is to be recognized in the constitutional law whereby society is governed, and thus it is to become a civil right. It is in accordance with their dignity as persons, that is, being endowed with reason and free will, and therefore privileged to bear personal responsibility, that all human beings should be at once impelled by nature, <laughs> impelled by nature, and also bound by a moral obligation to seek the truth, especially religious truth. They are also bound to adhere to the truth once it is known, and to order their whole lives in accord with the demands of truth. However, human beings cannot discharge these obligations in a manner in keeping with their own nature unless they enjoy immunity from external coercion as well as psychological freedom. Therefore, the right to religious freedom has its foundation not in the subjective disposition of the person, but in his very nature. In consequence, the right of this immunity continues to exist even in those who do not live up to their obligation of seeking the truth and adhering to it, and the exercise of this right is not to be impeded, provided that just public order be observed." Unquote. In the years after the Council, intense conflict erupted over the interpretation of Dignitaris Humanae. On the one end of the spectrum, there are the Lefebvreists and those sympathetic to their position. They regard the document as a significant rupture with the Church's past teaching that error has no rights and that therefore there could not be a general freedom of religion. Consequently, the Lefebvreists and their supporters regard the teaching of Dignitaris Humanae as a corruption of what they understand to be the teaching of the tradition. On the opposite side of the spectrum are those who also hold that the Declaration's teaching constitutes a rupture with past teaching. But for them, it was a welcome rupture. Rupture in this case gives them the justification to claim and bring about more ruptures with what is seen as a corrupted tradition. It is not hard to discern the antiquarian danger on the one end of the spectrum of those who claim rupture and presentism on the other end of the spectrum. In the following, I want to show that both positions are wrong in their shared assumption that Dignitaris Humanae constitutes a rupture with the Church's past teaching. On the contrary, in light of Newman's seven notes, the teaching of Dignitaris Humanae can clearly be identified as an authentic development of doctrine. I'm in deep agreement with the position of Ian Kerr the foremost contemporary scholar and biographer of John Henry Newman. In his most recent excellent book, Newman on Vatican II, he advances an argument with which I'm in full agreement and to which I'm indebted in the following discussion. Does Dignitatis Humanae display Newman's seven notes of authentic development? Let us turn to Newman's first note, preservation of type. Newman emphasizes that Preservation of type does not rule out all variations. Make considerable alterations of proportion and relation as time goes on in the parts or aspects of an idea. Ian Kerr applies this note to the Declaration of Religious Freedom and astutely argues that the fact that the Dignitaris Humanae may appear to contradict previous teaching does not in itself mean that it is not a genuine development. Before the Second Vatican Council, the condemnation of religious liberty meant that people were not free to choose whatever religion they pleased. And it is this false idea of religious freedom that 
is also rejected in Dignitaris Humanae when it declares that, quote, the one true religion subsists in the Catholic and Apostolic Church, and that all human beings are bound to seek the truth and to embrace the truth and to hold fast to it. Dignitaris Humanae also professes its belief that it is upon the human conscience that these obligations fall and exert their binding force. Nowhere does the document speak about freedom of conscience, implying that a person has the right to do whatever their conscience tells them to do, simply because their conscience tells them so. Cons consciences can be erroneous and need to be informed, or as the declaration puts it, every human being has the duty to seek the truth in matters of religion in order that he may be prudent that he may with prudence form for himself right and true judgments of conscience with the use of all suitable means. Accordingly, Dignitaris Humanae is unambiguous in its conclusion, namely, that the true idea of religious freedom, which the Council intends to teach, leaves untouched traditional Catholic doctrine on the moral duty of human beings and societies toward the true religion <coughs> and toward the one Church of Christ. Had the Council failed to embrace the idea of religious freedom expressed in Dignitaris Humanae, there would have been a very real danger of a corruption arising in Catholic theology, since, as Newman points out, quote, one cause of corruption is the refusal to follow the course of doctrine as it moves on, and an obstinacy in the notions of the past. Unquote. Please allow me at this point to refer back to my second part of lecture on conscience, what it is and why it matters. Some of you might have been there, some not, but I want to refer back to that. Recall that the Second Vatican Council's pastoral constitution of the Church in the modern world, Gaudium et Space, explicitly and fully recognizes the Church's classical doctrine of conscience as taught by Thomas Aquinas. Now, it would have been quite impossible for the Council to uphold and reaffirm the dignity of conscience in Gaudium et Spes and not draw the proper consequence from this teaching in Dignitaris Humanae. Had the Council refused to promulgate Dignitaris Humanae, it would have been, according to Newman, guilty of an obstinacy in the notions of the past, in short, guilty of antiquarianism. Rather, the Council had to teach the difference between authentic freedom, freedom for the truth, and its corruption, indifferentism regarding the truth. And precisely by doing this, the Council is displaying the note of the preservation of type. Let us turn to Newman's second note, continuity of principles. Newman recognizes that the difference between doctrines and principles sometimes depends on how we look at them. He states that the life of doctrines may be said to consist in the law or principles which they embody. So, which principles does Dignitaris Humanae embody? William <coughs> Kerr rightly puts the matter into a wider picture. Here, two principles seem to be relevant. The first is that at any moment in her history, certain aspects of what Newman called the Christian idea are inevitably stressed more than others. Thus, before the Second Vatican Council, the crucifixion, especially as represented in the sacrifice of the Mass, eclipsed the resurrection. Whereas since the Council, there has been a very strong swing of the pendulum the other way. The Church must constantly be seeking to balance the different aspects within excessive, without excessive imbalances. In the case of religious freedom, two doctrines are involved. The duty of all human beings to seek the true religion, which is Catholicism, and on the other hand, the reality of conscience. Dignitaris Humanae would seem, in holding both doctrines, to be a good example of this principle in practice. The second principle is that the Church has to take account of changing circumstances and to apply her doctrines accordingly. 
In the case of religious freedom, the first of the two doctrines was assumed in a totally Catholic context, like Italy, for example, to require the legal exclusion of all other erroneous religions, if only to ensure that, as the declaration itself allows for, the just requirements of public order to be observed. Nevertheless, Newman recognized that even in the 19th century, Italy was less than completely Catholic, and that the church would be better off not using coercion through legal and political means. In the pluralist society, the church does not have the power to impose its will, and has to interpret the doctrine in a different way from Pope Pius IX. Dignitaris Humanae insists on the continuity of the underlying principles that inform its teaching, and hence it displays the note of the continuity of principles. Newman's third note is power of assimilation, or unitive power. Newman observes that doctrine and views which relate to man are not placed in a void, but in the crowded world, and make way for themselves by interpenetration and develop by absorption. He concludes that the Catholic Church can consult expedience more freely than other bodies as trusting in her living tradition and is sometimes thought to disregard principle and scruple when she is but dispensing with forms. Ian Carr rightly observes that Dignitaris Humanae in its opening paragraph explicitly recognizes that the Council is responding to external influences when it refers to the growing sense of the dignity of the human person and the importance of responsible freedom as opposed to state coercion. In other words, the Church is willing to absorb ideas emanating from secular thought without fear of compromising her own essential doctrines. We are ready to turn to Newman's fourth note, logical sequence. Nota bene, this note does not necessarily mean a conscious reasoning from premise to conclusion. All that is required is that a doctrine should seem to be the logical issue of its original teaching. Recall that the traditional teaching was that the Catholic religion is the one true religion and that all human beings are bound in conscience to embrace it. Yet the Declaration calls attention to the fact that, quote, the truth cannot impose itself except by virtue of its own truth. And that therefore religious freedom is necessary to fulfill the duty of adhering to the true religion. In other words, to follow one's conscience and to fulfill one's duty, one has to have the freedom to do so. For after all, as Dignitaris Humanae states, quote, it is not it is one of the major tenets of Catholic doctrine that man's response to God must be free, unquote. In order to follow one's conscience and in order to fulfill one's duty, one must have the freedom to do so. What about Newman's fifth note, anticipation of the future, whereby definite specimens of advanced teaching very clearly occur which in the historical course are not found till at a later date. Ian Kerr points out astutely that it would be hard to imagine a better example of such early intimations of tendencies which afterwards are fully realized than the example of Jesus Christ himself, who as Dignitaris Humanae states in Article 11, bore witness to the truth but refused to impose the truth by force on those who spoke against it." Unquote. Newman's sixth note, conservative action upon its past, identifies a development which is conservative of the course of antecedent developments, being really those antecedents and something besides them. It is an addition which illustrates, not obscures, corroborates, not corrects, body of thought from which it proceeds. Discussion of the first note has already shown that Dignitaris Humani preserves the two teachings that human beings are not free to choose whatever religion they choose, 
but that they have a duty to seek and hold the true religion, and that the true religion is to be found in the Catholic Church. The declaration only seemed to be a departure from the previous teaching because of the way it was taken to apply in a homogeneous Catholic context. But the teaching is one thing, its interpretation and implementation another. The essential teaching has been preserved, and therefore the declaration passes Newman's sixth test. Last but not least, there is chronic vigor, the seventh note of an authentic development of doctrine. Dignitaris Humanae would seem clearly to display this note if some 50 years are anything to go by. While there are still the Fabrists who reject it as contrary to the constant teaching and tradition of the Church, the Catholic Church as a whole has received the teaching as authentic, and any reversal of it seems to be out of the question. Popes John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis have continuously affirmed the teaching of Dignitatis Humanae. In sum, in light of Newman's notes or tests, the teaching of Dignitatis Humanae on religious freedom is an authentic doctrinal development. Newman's seven notes do very usefully serve as answers to objections brought against the decisions of authority, that is, the Lefebvreists and those sympathetic to their position. But they also answer those on the opposite side of the spectrum, who hold also that the document constitutes a rupture with past teaching, albeit in their own view a welcome rupture. Cardinal Everett Dulles's assessment comports well with Father Carr's judgment. Dulles states that the Council, quote, applied the unchanging principles of the right to religious freedom and the duty to uphold religious truth to the conditions of an individualist age in which almost all societies are religiously pluralist. Under such circumstances, the establishment of religion becomes the exception rather than the rule. But the principle of non-coercion of consciences in matters of faith remains constant." Unquote. Let me come to my conclusion why the development of doctrine matters. The development of doctrine gives concrete witness to the continuous mission of the Holy Spirit to guide the church into all the truth. Truth cannot contradict truth, and the Holy Spirit does not contradict himself. Consequently, antiquarianism and presentism resist the mission and work of the Holy Spirit, the one by absolutizing allegedly pristine origins in blatant disregard of the Spirit's continuing guidance into the truth, the other by severing the Spirit's past guidance into the truth from the Spirit's present guidance, undercutting thereby the identity of the Spirit's mission, past, present, and future. And Aquarianism and Presentism are static, reductive, and eventually unsustainable. In short, they lack chronic vigor. The development of doctrine is concrete pneumatology and ecclesiology in their doctrinal expression. To be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. The Catholic is deep in history, the history of salvation stored in the doctrinal memory of the Church. The truth into which the Holy Spirit guides has a living history, the development of doctrine and a concrete living body with a hierarchical and magisterial expression. Quote, the Church of the Living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15. I thank you for your attention. All right, take a deep breath. There's now time for conversation, I can step out from behind my reading post, and they have to redirect the camera all the time now, <laughs> I'm going to move a bit around, go on. Uh, Dr. Dr. thank you very much for, for that uh, thought-provoking presentation. Um, 
Uh, the very last thing that you were saying about carotid uh, vigor raised a, a question uh, for, for me. Um, and I, I ask you to please correct me if, my, um, if the historical references that are coming to mind are inaccurate. Uh, but there is uh, an error which I think is based on a misinterpretation of Vincent of Larens, if I remember correctly, which is uh, an error that um, that is that the church's teaching matures in the same way, like analogously as a child matures. Um, I, I was wondering um, if you're familiar with, with this you know, error as it's been defined or identified, and if, and if uh, the uh, note with regard to uh, Quranic vigor might be a good uh, protection, a guard against this error. Well, Newman makes use of, of uh, Vincent Lerin and that uh, mm -hmm. uh, image in the first note, if you mm -hmm. remember. Mm -hmm. So he draws positively on that image, okay. namely that there is a maturation. Uh, preservation of type means something can mature, but it keeps the same type. And That's so, it. Okay. so a person. So I, I don't th think there's a problem with that. No, no, no. I, I no. I, I don't. I don't think that there is a problem the, with it as long as the type is preserved. But well, that's um, the whole precondition. He uses the biological image, and the biological image, so to speak, by definition, um, in the in the growth of a life organism, you have the preservation of time. Right. Otherwise, you would lose the species, or you have a transmutation to something else. And so, mm -hmm. Vincent draws on that already, and Newman picks it up. That, that's that's right. Uh, I, I knew that I knew that in Vincent's understanding that that it could be that it could be interpreted in a faithful way. I I I think during the during the uh, anti-modernist controversies, there was um, there there was a pronouncement against a particular misinterpretation of that. And I, I think that what you're describing with regard to I would have to ask Vincent. Father de Gaulle to okay. give me the to give me the historical yes. background of that condemnation. I wouldn't know yes. off the top of my head yeah. what the specifics were. Okay. Newman himself was a bit uh, critical with another one of of, of Vincent's. Um, uh, Vincent's principles. Uh, as an Anglican, he was very much in favor, maybe that, um, uh, uh, so to speak, the Catholicity of the Church's teaching is 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 to uh, is, is to be that what has been taught in all times and in all places, mm -hmm. in a way. And he he shows that increasingly that this is actually a principle that you cannot really apply. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work because it's hard to find out actually whether something was really taught in all places at one time, and also across time, and by all. And it's, it's actually, Dewey became more and more critical of that one um, uh, in, in, in his later, in his Catholic years especially. But the organic one he, he affirms uh, uh, in 1845, and it's back in 1878 in, in the book, um, as a solid one, assuming the analogy is is to speak a species analogy, that there is a, a type of species that remains the same, and you have just kind of an organic growth. Great, thank you. Yes? Was this concern over rupture one of the reasons that the Pius X group separated from the church? Uh, under the French cardinal, I can't remember. The fabric. I said that yes. the fabric, yeah. Uh, after the council? Yeah, yeah. They thought that the whole issue, and for them, the issue of accepting parts or the whole second thing has, has to do with the question of rupture. That there is something they, they cannot see a certain development in, in place, uh, um, but rather a rupture. And that is for them a sign of a crisis or a sign of a corruption. And, and that caused them not, they wouldn't use the term schism themselves, only that, that they would find themselves in a place being put there. But that is basically the context of a part of, and this document that I, I discussed is part of that, not all, but part of the conflict. Do you think they'll ever come back? Oh. There's been so many overtures to them, right? Uh, this question I leave to the fathers in the room, in the, in the, in the, in the Catholic theologians <laughs> who are, who are uh, there's Father Henshi back there, has been at the Second Vatican Council, we can ask him. So I, I don't have prophetic foresight uh, or prophetic knowledge. Um, there seem to be, you, you read the same newspapers or blogs as I do, there are rumors right now that Pope Francis might, that might be something. Um, and the Catholic Church, rightly speaking, of course, always reaches out. The Catholic Church is not interested at all in maintaining schismatic situations. 
um, you, you, you don't betray the truth, of course, uh, but you always reach out in a way to, uh, to, to bring back uh, people into the body. That was the case in the early church. It sometimes takes long. Our, of course, we have become very impatient as modern people, so for us, 50 years is a long period. By the church's tradition standards, it's not that long. Um, and some things, some knots, when they have been formed in a complex way, existentially, doctrinally, and culturally, to untie those knots, there's a lady who does that as a specialist, you can ask her, her prayers, but the untying of those knots can take time, and, and can take considerable time. And so I think the Catholic Church's goal is very much so to, to work for reconciliation. Um, but it's not something you can force, and you, you don't want to do it in the sense of a political deal, or we give you something, you give us something. That is never going to last at the end. Uh, but I don't know, I, I don't have prophetic foresight trying to think with the church and play with the church. I hope it will happen, as the church had, had a very important document on, on, uh, uh, on ecumenical a reconciliation <coughs> and, unit, uh, and uh, Udunum Sint by John Paul II, a very important mandate, ecumenism belonging to the heart of the Christian, of the Catholic identity. Um, you, can, you can say in equivalent, the overcoming of schism as an ongoing attempt is always to be there. But how long it takes? The Holy Spirit knows. Yes, Father? Dr. Buddha, thank you for a very informative lecture. Um, I had to write out my question, but uh, what do you think Newman would say about doctrines that may have been neglected or not developed sufficiently in history, and can they be later recovered and developed later on? And I'm thinking about kind of the context of the 20th century in theology, and even simple things like the vernacular in the liturgy, you know, which is something that um, was out of use for hundreds of years. So is it possible for the church to neglect or even reject an authentic development of doctrine that the Holy Spirit, you know, would be trying to <laughs> propose for the church, but sort of push to the side or something like that? Well, yeah, I think Newman would be quite open to, to considering that, though he would always say we, we, we cannot think all too much abstractly about that. Um, and we often only find out in retrospect. So you gave a one good example there is uh, that we know now in retrospect because we have the conciliar decision. Before the conciliar decision, it would have been very hard in people living in the Church of Trent, as we say, to see that as a, as a problem. You needed, you needed uh, the, 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 the Second Vatican Council and the changes to begin to see, um, to see the, the issues and the advantages, the return of the vernacular. And if you read the council texts, of course, carefully, the council didn't uh, prescribe the return of the vernacular in the way as it took place after the council. The council texts are much more conservative on that. So we can say we have had a bit of a de facto development after the Council that has been widely acknowledged and is seen as greatly advantageous in, in many ways. And those things uh, that can be the case, I think, but it is, uh, as a general statement, of course, it's, it's vague. Um, because there might have been also good reasons for the magisterium, reasons of principle or reasons of uh, practical judgment why a certain development is also discouraged at a certain time. Because often it's also a matter of timeliness and untimeliness when, when some proposals are brought up. And they might be, they might be premature. Uh, um, and, and there the pastoral discernment of the magisterium plays a role. So your question opens a, uh, opens a wide field, but Newman would have, Newman being always a, a, a concrete thinker, of, of, of concrete examples, of concrete historical data, he would step back from speculations about that and say, you one example that you gave is a very good one. And one can say, yeah, okay, here we can see it um, in all its complexity, of course, um, because the vernacular is a relative matter. You can go to certain areas where people say, why don't we have the mass in our home dialect? In Germany, we still have some strong dialects in certain areas. Like Bavarian is not like High German, I tell you. And if you would have a North German Catholic 
attend a mass that is done in a strong Bavarian dialect, the mass could as well be in Latin. <laughs> for, for that. So, so the vernacular, if we, if we look closer, is in and of itself um, a complex reality that has to be negotiated in the church because you want to hold together um, the, the accessibility to people but also to, to all people besides a small group. That's a pastoral issue, of course. Um, and I think the council was aware of that in its somewhat reticent statement in Sacrosanctum Concilium to, to, to not at that moment, so to speak, blow open everything, but to hold the Latin as a received universal liturgical language and open up to the vernacular. Now, things have developed since then, and that's, that's fine, but we also see, I think, some internal issues and difficulties that emerge with, let's say, pushing the vernacular too, too far. And, and that's a pragmatic matter then, for the church, a practical pastoral matter to hold that in rain. But the fundamental question is a good one, as long as it's not turned into a speculative one. And we have then antiquarians going out to find in the history of the church strands or something that we could pick up and see, could we, could we do something with that? Oh, Father Angie. Yeah. You see a little uh, tension in the, the definition of Vatican I with the word understanding. For example, the last word in the quotation you have here mm -hmm. is the same understanding. Mm -hmm. But four lines above may understanding increase. So wouldn't it be that Vatican I was moving in this direction or it seems to me there's a lifelong battle between creative fidelity and faithful creativity. And I think we'll never solve it. It's like contemplative it's rather it, it, There's always something that urges onward and, and all that. I think you're on to something that would require another lecture that I want to leave out. <laughs> Father Henchy, <laughs> having been at Vatican II, he's, he's one of the real pros. I'm an amateur. He's, he's, oh, no, that's very true. So you put your finger on something that is supposed to be hidden away in, in, the, in the lecture under the rug. When I said I, I understand Vatican I and Vatican II as complementary, I made, so to speak, a normative statement that I would have to defend, which I wasn't able to defend in this lecture. Um, because there are people who would like to drive a wedge between the Vatican I reading on dogma and the Vatican II reading. Um, that would be people who would be more interested in a rupture reading. And you, see, you rightly see a certain tension between the two because the Council Fathers emphasize different things. Now, inside of Vatican I, I don't see that tension because you can say, I understand something, and you can have a deepening or an intensification of that understanding without that understanding, so to speak, slowly moving away from, the, from that what was originally given. And so I read the fathers in the, in, the, in the first quote, the fathers of Vatican I, working with intensification and with a, with a logic of what is implicit becoming explicit. So the more our understanding intensifies, the more certain things that are implicit become explicit. And so in the end we can say, wow, our understanding has really developed. But it's the, the understanding of the same mystery, of the same fundamental subject matter. I, I think that's the, the dynamic they want to work with. The, the uh, Vatican II fathers, in the, in the brief quote from Dei Verbum, indeed work more um, with, with what you call a creative understanding. There's a pondering, that pondering can happen by lay people, when as they read scripture, it can happen in the preaching of the bishops, and so on. And the, the creative understanding is, is more the image on the lines of a discovery of something that we haven't seen before. It's more like in an image. You look at an image and you like, see a piece of art that is very rich, and you suddenly see something you have never seen beforehand. It has been there, but the image of implicit and explicit doesn't work here because now you see something for the first time that might change to a certain way how you see the rest. And that is a bit more how the fathers of the Second Vatican Council, as I understand them, 
tend to read. And I try to put the two together still as complementary. And that creates what you call rightly the tension. But it's a good tension. That's, that's the tension that Pope Benedict the, the XVI called um, as a, in the way we should receive Vatican II as um, the, the tension is between continuity and reform. That those two, that those two things uh, are not to be separated. So hermeneutics of, uh, of continuity is not at all opposed to a hermeneutics of reform. But continuity implies reform, and you cannot have a real reform without continuity. Otherwise, you don't even know what you're reforming. <laughs> Did, is that helpful? I mean, not that I, I cannot, I cannot uh, recapture the rich discussion of the development of doctrine works in the, in the period between the councils. This is where all the important works were written on that. We're still drawing on that. Yes? On the very way back, for, uh, uh, brother, there's a lady. Uh. I read some scholars were positing uh, a theory of the organic development of the liturgy and some rules for that. And I'm wondering if this theory is necessary or if it's a special thing to be used now for. Or for the liturgy specifically? Exactly. I'm wondering how development from liturgy could or should really come in and help. Oh, this is a big question. You have no idea what you're asking here, <laughs> especially someone who's not a liturgist expert. Um, I think the notes can be, I think, thoughtfully applied to that uh, a question too, though it is not, it is related to doctrine, but it is not itself a doctrinal development. And so some other factors might come into play here. If we were to understand the liturgy not in, so speak, relationship to the to the early to the origins of the Christian liturgy, I think we would we would be in a problematic situation as Catholics, because we also would not, you know, we wouldn't even understand the echoes anymore, the curia eleison, for example, early forms of of liturgical elements that that the uh, tradition has preserved. We could not be in a good ecumenical dialogue with the Orthodox at all if we were to understand our own liturgy only in the sense of our rupture. So now, like let's say post-Vatican II, we simply came up with something new. This is not helpful for the Orthodox. That will be for them a sign of alarm and more as a sign that we lost something essential. And so even for, for key ecumenical conversations, being able to show and give an account of a development of the liturgy is the minimum we have to deliver to the Orthodox. I'm looking at uh, watching Father Bema's face, mm -hmm. see whether he's nodding or not on that one. Uh, but that, that would be, I think, one important way to think about it, not simply isolating it from our contemporary ecumenical imperatives, especially with the Orthodox. It doesn't, it won't satisfy them easily, but if we can't even come up with an with organic development of the liturgy, we are in real trouble in relationship to the Orthodox. Brother Jerome? Yeah, I'm just going back to the um, comment made earlier about the vernacular in the liturgy. Um, before the Second Vatican Council, you made the point that it would be hard for people to see that as a, um, as a um, true development in doctrine um, because of the context in which they were. And then also the post Vatican II rejection of the document you talked about by the Lefebvre's group. Those two things, in a way, seem to point to a question about the um, application of the principles of the doctrine, in that it can be seen to be a post factum validation by the winners of the doctrinal dispute, so to speak, um, because you can't see a particular doctrine as um, a true development before it comes about, and another one can be attacked as not being a true development after it's come about. How do you safeguard this principle from being seen as merely the, um, yeah, the, the self-validation of the victorious party? How does it actually have an um, objective strength for use in talking about development of doctrine? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think Newman was some way implicitly aware of that, though he didn't, he didn't uh, resolve that because he had a particular, in the original version, a particular question in mind, namely to overcome the objection that there cannot be in principle 
any development beyond scripture or let's say the earliest doctrinal formulations. That was the Anglican position and he had to argue against that, make a case against that with the help of the seven nouns, that there's something like an organic development. I think you are right in perceiving Newman, and I must say this is something I like about Newman, that's deeply Catholic, that the notes work primarily retrospectively. Now, if the church were indeed just uh, um, uh, a secular power group, then your criticism would hold. Um, uh, if we just talk about groups in, the, in which you have winners and losers somehow, and the winners apply to their own results uh, the notes of the development of doctrine and, and affirm themselves, uh, then, then you're right. Uh, in other words, the notes presuppose what I said at the beginning, at the end, they presuppose the circle of the faith, namely that what we are talking about is the church, the Christ-rooted and spirit-filled church. And Newman assumes that too when you read his work, it's not the work, so to speak, of a neutral historian of dogma, neutral in the modern sense of a, of a distanced historian, but he is involved in the reading of history, so to speak, as a reader with faith, uh, who looks at the martyrs, who looks at the early church council, uh, as has been an involved participant, seeking for the Catholic voice in the, in the history of the councils. Where is he going? And so what he understands to be winning is the voice of the spirit leading the church into the truth and not simply a majority party or the political powerful party. In other words, if you were to subsume, if we accept that, if you were to accept that, um, not only would we lose the point of Newman's seven notes, but we would saw off the branch on which we are sitting um, as Catholic theologians and as Catholic historians of dogma. We would simply acknowledge that the church is, like any other group, a group with disagreements over time, and the group might hold together, and those who win write the history. Um, as soon as that axiom is adopted, we are in a completely different ballgame. And there's no spirit leading into all the truth, and there cannot be uh, really a proper development of doctrine. You have then to adopt either a Nietzschean hermeneutics, there is a, there is an, a, 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 there's a will to power, and all history you get is power history, the history of the winners, or you have to adopt a Hegelian hermeneutics, that the development is simply the self-explication of an, of an internal logic, a logic of which we are simply the puppets, so to speak. It, it, it develops by itself. It's something like an iron logic or dialectic and comes out whether you like it or not. But Newman would refute the one as much as the other because both uh, destroy the reality of the faith and want to do without and have to do without. But ultimately, uh, if you're right, in the circle of faith, the notes work primarily, with primarily retrospective. And that is simply an acknowledgement that the magisterium is an integral component of the spirits working out the development of doctrine. In other words, we need the magisterial decision, the universal magisterium of the bishops in union with the Holy See, in order to help us as the faithful see what indeed a development is and was. It is not up, so to speak, to our own private judgment to announce development or to announce a new, so to speak, trajectory of announcements and let's get initiatives together, let's put down signatures and send them to Rome. We would like this development, another one, that one, and a third one, that one, well, you know, let's assume. And what we want is simply our own projections seem to move moving forward. So I think that's, and I think Newman is, is very important in that regard still for the contemporary discussion in, in the church because we, you know, what I call antiquarianism and presentism are both alive. I haven't looked on my watch, I don't know, but whoops, five to three, is that, what does that mean? Time for coffee and tea and cake, or